Hey guys, you'll be Holo one here. Welcome back to another video, and today we are back in my basement with a, uh, a new train for me. This is the 1989 release by Lionel of the Reading Railroad T1. So there's a couple reasons why I got this train. Um, the first being that I've wanted one of these for a while now. Um, the second being that it is a massive locomotive. It's the biggest train I own. Um, and it will probably be the biggest train I own for a while. Uh, and the third being that this is equipped with Lionel's digital rail sounds, um, which were new back in the late 80s. The first train they were ever put in is the B6, set number 6-18000. This is set number 6-18006. So... If I can do math correctly, this would have been the sixth locomotive produced by Lionel with digital rail sounds, which in my opinion makes it really cool. So, while it does have digital rail sounds, in the words of my father, they leave much to be desired. Um, the rail sounds in this engine are not what you get in like modern legacy locomotives or what you'd get in TMCC trains. This consists of a chuff, a whistle, and a bell, and some steam background sounds when it's standing still. Um, and the chuff rate is one chuff per revolution, which is a far cry from what normal steam locomotives are, which is four chuffs per revolution. But nevertheless, this train still is awesome in my opinion. Even though it doesn't have the best sound system, as evident by the rest of my collection, being mostly post-war stuff without sound systems, um, apart from those two, but that sound system's actually broken in that diesel, but I'm working on that. Uh, sound isn't really a massive deal to me. I don't need it to be prototypical, I just like it because it sounds cool and it's got some history behind it. So this train is somewhat of the quote-unquote middle child um, of my collection. Uh, the next train I have in the year in terms of like when it was produced after this is the department 56 hudson that was built in 1999 and the newest train i have before this i believe is this switcher which was made somewhere in the like 50s or 60s i think um can't remember exactly but uh it's interesting how much like technology has changed from that one to the Hudson, which is under there somewhere, um, especially in terms of operation. This locomotive has a mechanical E-unit in it, unlike most newer trains that use a digital E-unit that's usually contained within a circuit board somewhere. But because this train has a mechanical E-unit, it needs to have a, like, a lever, kind of, somewhere, where, if I look on a post-war train, this lever is what locks out the E-unit. If you look at the T1, there is no lever anywhere. Instead, there is a plug on the inside of the cab um, that you really can't see because, you know, it's in the cab, but it's in there. Um, and that is actually how the switch works between left position and right position, just like this would be in left position versus right position. So another really cool feature about this train is that it has directional lighting. Um, it does, in fact, have an operational backup light that turns on when it is going backwards. Um, and then it has the headlight, which is just always on. Now, when I first got this train, I was not expecting that. I was expecting it just to have the forward and reverse light always on, when uh, whether it was going forward, neutral, or reverse. But... Uh, that's actually not the case. This train actually has a functioning reverse light, um, if you want to call it a light. It's more of a very faint glow in the back, and you have to have it going pretty darn quick in order to uh, actually be able to see it clearly. Um, the headlight does not have that problem. The headlight is very visible, no matter what voltage it's on, which is amazing. Uh, it also has a really nice color to it. But uh, directional lighting in 1989 was... Not something I was expecting, especially given that the Hudson doesn't have directional lighting, which just further deepens the mystery as to why it doesn't. 
Now, I don't normally do history on the trains that I buy, but I'm going to for this one because I like the Reading T ones. Um, basically, in the time of World War II, the Reading Railroad needed a bunch of power because they just didn't have enough trains in service. So they started pulling a bunch of trains out of retirement, and uh, they encountered a pretty big problem. They did not have enough power. They had enough locomotives, but they did not have enough power. They needed newer trains rather than just pulling the old ones that they had retired for probably good reason out of um, back into service. So uh, the Reading Railroad decided, okay, let's take these 30 I-10 280 consolidation type steam locomotives, 280 meaning they had two wheels on the lead truck, eight drivers, and no trailing truck, and let's rebuild them into 484 Northerns. Great idea. Um, so they brought them into the shop, and uh, Baldwin was like, all right, we'll help you with this. So uh, they sent them, like, new boilers, new cylinders, new drivers, new leading, new trailing trucks. They sent them pretty much everything new, and they built more or less a new locomotive. However, because it was built off of the I-10 class, which was technically a proven design, they were actually allowed to use them and uh, they proved their worth. They were extremely powerful trains. Um, they were mostly designed for freight service, having a top speed of about 60 to 70 miles per hour. However, when steam ended on the Reading Railroad, they de- uh, the Reading Company decided to do something that no other railroad had, or at least they hadn't done it to the extent that the Reading did it, and that was to start the Reading Rambles, which was basically they restored, I think it's four, of their Reading T1s, and um, they uh, put them into passenger service, and they out- they outfitted them with yellow trim, um, as seen here. They had yellow trim down the walkways, they had yellow handrails, they had, and they had some uh, yellow accents on the back of the tender, and they looked really pretty. They also had white wool drivers, which looks great. Um, this train, number 2100, uh, is actually currently being restored to operating condition by the American Steam Railroad and uh, it's gonna be really cool when it's done. Anyway, back to this model. Um, This train is one of two scale locomotives I have now. Uh, Now when I say scale, that's the other one. The 10th anniversary Polar Express is a scale model of a 284 Berkshire type steam locomotive, um, mainly Pure Marquette number 1225 that they just relettered the tender. Now, when I say O scale, I usually run O gauge. At least that's what I call it. Other people call it O27, I call it O gauge. Now, if you're wondering the difference between O gauge and O scale, I'm gonna go get an O-gauge heavyweight car and put it in front of the O-scale Polar Express heavyweights and show you the difference. So here is the O-gauge Manhattan car that I restored with the uh, 1948 GG1 number 2332. Pretty nice car, pretty big. And then that's the O-scale. So yeah, it's it's a little bigger. Um, basically, all the O gauge stuff is done to a slightly smaller scale than O scale. The biggest example is between the O gauge GG1 that I have and the Vision Line GG1. Now I do not have a Vision Line GG1, and the O gauge GG1 is at college right now. So, I can't really do that comparison, but I can do this, and, uh, they're not small, but, uh, they're also nothing compared to O-Scale. And as another example, we have a Reading open-end gondola and a Lehigh Valley depressed flat car. O-Scale, O-Gauge. So, uh, enough of all this. Here's the train not moving. Let's do some running shots of this beautiful locomotive.
That does not have TMCC in it, so I have to actually do everything here at the control panel. Uh, so that'll be fun to film. Yay. So if you guys wanted a, a sound sample, I put it on the middle loop because it uses this transformer which has a whistle and a bell bu uh, button. This transformer doesn't. This is what runs this loop. So there's your idling steam background sounds. Here's the whistle.
And then here's the bell. And then uh, it's got that wonderful uh, one chuff per revolution chuff rate. So uh, there's your sound sample. And there you have it. This is the Lionel 1989 Reading Railroad T1484 Northern with digital rail sounds. Uh, beautiful engine. It's my new favorite in my collection. Um, obviously, if you guys are looking for like high-end detail, like a real coal load and proper colors and not having a tether connecting the locomotive and the tender, because they didn't put pickup rollers on the tender, um, for some reason, uh, get the Legacy model. But from a collector's point of view, this is top quality stuff in my opinion. Um, I would much rather have this than the Legacy model, just because of all the history behind it. This, for me, signals the beginning of what I call the modern era, where digital rail sounds became the new frontier in model railroading. For, at least for Lionel. But, uh, I absolutely love this thing. So, I'll be running it a lot when I'm actually home and not at college. But, uh, anyway, I am CRB Hollow One, and have a good day, or maybe good night in your case. See ya.